When talking about the mistakes that the Germans made during Operation Barbarossa, they always mentioned their lack of foresight in the face of winter, their miscalculations about the Soviet armed forces, or the various changes in direction of the German army groups, which allegedly diverted them from their primary goal. Another of the most common mistakes made when talking about this military operation is to point out that the main German objective in that 1941 campaign was to reach the Archangel Line in the north, and Astrakhan in the south. Along the way, cities such as Kiev, Leningrad, Moscow, Rostov, Sevastopol, or Stalingrad would be conquered. Although this is not a lie, it is not entirely true either, since the main objective above all others was to annihilate the Red Army. After this, they would advance without any problem until they occupied the different locations indicated. When the planning of Operation Barbarossa was carried out, as well as its various rehearsals and war games, many factors were taken into account that are rarely mentioned when talking about this event. One of them was the need to take breaks every three or four weeks in advance, to reorganize the different units and give them a little rest. When these pauses were made during the end of July, it is often said that it was due to the Red Army, or due to lack of preparation, but the reality is that these pauses were within the plan. Another issue that has also been heavily criticized was the diversion of Army Group Center, which in early September was diverted to encircle the Soviets in Kiev. Again, this was something that had already been foreseen, since it was clear that the Centro Group was the most powerful and the one that was going to advance the fastest. Because of this, he would have to pivot to secure his flanks, and to inflict heavy blows on the Soviets from their rear. A third point that generates much controversy is the need to finish the campaign during this first operation. And it is that, although it is not well known when the operation was planned, the idea that the German offensive would end by the end of October was taken into account, regardless of the progress achieved to date. From then on the German units would be quartered to spend the winter and recover from the damage suffered. Already during the spring of 1942 they would continue their advance and finish defeating the Soviets. During this stage, the rear guard would be completely consolidated, and railway lines would be built to facilitate the arrival of supplies to the new front line, from which it was also intended to continue the offensive. It would be at this time that the winter equipment would be sent to the German troops, since due to the lack of fighting, the supply lines would not be overloaded. The question we have to ask ourselves next is the following. If as we have seen, everything was foreseen and planned, why was the decision finally made to launch desperately towards Moscow or Rostov, with winter already upon us? As we all know, it was precisely in this last push, in which the German army wore itself out the most, and its future actions were already compromised forever. To find the answer to this, we have to analyze what had happened in previous campaigns, or during the early stages of Operation Barbarossa. To see it chronologically, let's start with the French campaign. When the Germans attacked France in May 1940, they had no advantage objectively. The French army both in number and quality, was equal to or superior to the German, and also had the help of the British army. In addition, they had strong defensive positions as was the case with the Maginot Line, and all they had to do was passively withstand the German attack. However, all these elements turned against him, since his military doctrine was completely outdated. The Germans, for their part, made many mistakes and recklessness that they were about to pay dearly for, although everything turned out well for them in the end. During their raid on France, the Germans did not value a series of factors that were very important, and that later they would not have on the Eastern Front. An excellent network of roads along which his armies moved through France at full speed. A total air superiority that, in addition to preventing the attacks of the Allied planes, offered them support at any point on the front, as soon as the ground units requested it. This was also due to the fact that the military operations were carried out in a considerably small space. Another factor was the logistical facility that the German army had at all times. And it is that due to how close the German starting bases were, there was not much problem in being able to keep up with the pace of advance and most of the problems that arose in the race towards the French coast could be solved in a very short time. As we will see below, what would happen when the front was not hundreds of kilometers from the German border itself, but thousands of kilometers away, with an advance of the vanguard units that seemed endless. 
without good roads and even railways, how were they going to supply their troops? One last point was the attitude of the soldiers against whom the Germans had fought before facing the Soviets. Although acts of heroism occurred in all countries, the custom was that after a forceful show of German force, the enemy army collapsed and even fled. All these factors, in which they were capable of resolving any situation and destroying their enemies, made them feel invincible and made it very difficult for them to analyze their actions objectively. In short, the Germans were so euphoric that they did not want to pay attention to their failures and some of their fortuitous successes. When the Germans begin their first operations over the Soviet Union at the end of June 1941, the results are much better than expected. Before them they find an army totally inoperative and with hardly any capacity to react. Thousands of Soviet soldiers are taken prisoner every day and Stalin's surrender seems to be around the corner with each new pocketing of troops. Like a horse that has had a stick with a carrot stuck up its ass, the Germans continue to advance further and further into Soviet territory, making ever greater efforts. Little by little, the German panzer divisions, these being the spearheads of their army, became more worn out, either by combat actions, or because their armor broke down on their own. The situation for the infantry was not much better, and their divisions were increasingly less effective. This, however, was not an impediment to continue advancing and to continue obtaining victories. At the end of September, when all the estimates that the Germans had made about the Red Army had already been defeated, the Wehrmacht was still far from Moscow. At this time, the capacity of the German army was far from adequate to continue launching offensives, and it urgently needed rest and re-equipment. Driven by their euphoria and motivation, some generals, including Guderian, had begun to act almost on their own, not obeying the orders of their superiors. This again was a vice they came with from previous campaigns. At this point, and letting themselves be carried away by this belief that they were practically all-powerful, and that the Red Army had already been widely defeated, by October they decide to launch the attack again. All analysts agree that had they stopped the offensive at this point, and gone on the defensive while recovering from their losses, the Germans would have been able to restart their offensive in the spring of 1942, in much more optimal conditions than they ended up doing. They would not only have had the capacity to attack the southern sector of the Soviet Union as they did, but would have been able to launch in three directions simultaneously. In addition, the Soviet intention was to launch strong counterattacks during the months of October, November, and December, so they would have been depleted after launching against a defensive German army. In any case, and as paradoxical as it may be, the Germans would again make the mistake of trying to cover more than they could, when after the initial successes of the Blue Operation, they make a similar decision. In short, the main cause of Germany's defeat in Russia was neither the weather, nor the most advanced Soviet tanks, nor the Red Army's ability to pull itself together over and over again. It was rather their overconfidence, which prevented them from realizing where and when to stop, and from believing that their weakened panzer divisions were invincible. Many of these reflections are explained in great detail in this book by Jose Antonio Artero, entitled, Behind the Myth. I recommend that you take a look at the direct that we recently had with him, in which we deal with similar issues to those we have seen in the video. We say goodbye here. Many thanks to everyone, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.